If I haven't met you, my name's Jody, and I get to be one of the overseers, and I get to be on the preaching team here. And as Brandon alluded, in this season of Advent, uh, the four weeks leading up to Christmas, we've been looking at four of the titles that were given to Jesus. And titles are a really, really funny thing. Um, often we forget what the title really means, as I wrote in the weekly view. Uh, you're a rock star doesn't mean what it really should mean anymore. You know, we, we, we lose the context of the original meaning of a title. And so it is with Everlasting Father. But let me, let me give you an example. Um, my wife and I, for 10 years, we lived in uh, Maryland, in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, the Annapolis area. And that meant we got to go to Washington, D.C. quite a bit. And I learned this. Uh, you've heard the title lobbyist. Have you ever heard the title lobbyist? And we all know what a lobbyist is. A lobbyist, you know, you think of some smoke-filled room and expensive drinks and dinners and deal-making behind the scenes, and that's the way things get done. That's a lobbyist. Right? Well, where did that phrase come from, lobbyist? Well, my wife and I, we were uh, in, in D.C., and just a block away from the um, White House is a very famous old hotel. I think it was built in 1812, and it's called the Willard. And 150 years ago, President Grant, there's a picture of the lobby of the Willard right now. 150 years ago, the 18th president of the United States, President Grant, he used to like to end his day walking from the White House to the Willard to go to the lobby bar. Can you imagine the president walking across the street to go to the lobby bar to enjoy a cigar? And so people knew that this was happening every day. And so what did they do? They started hanging out in the lobby, trying to get the attention of the president and get something from him. And he famously said in Vanity Fair magazine, those damn lobbyists. And that is where we get the term lobbyist. Now, evidently, the term lobbyist actually came uh, 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 from England before that, but it was Grant that put it into our lexicon. So what I want you to remember from this is we should never take a title, ready, for granted. <laughs> I wrote that joke. I wrote that joke. Some of you are going to use that at your Christmas party, I think. Some of you are going to use that. We should never use titles for granted. And, and here we are in this season of Advent, these four weeks leading up to Christmas, and we've been talking about wonderful counselor, mighty God, and today, everlasting father, and then prince of peace. Now, those titles were given to Jesus way, way before Jesus was born. In fact, it was about 730 years before Jesus was born. The prophet Isaiah said, he shall be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. And what was he talking about? Well, Isaiah, if I had to encapsulate Isaiah in one phrase, the entire book of Isaiah, the entire book of Isaiah is really about hope during exile. See, what was happening at that time, Israel, there was a lot of sin, there was a lot of corruption, there were a lot of bad things going on, and Isaiah, he told the leaders, he said, this is what's going to happen because of this sin, because of this, this, this corruption you see those Assyrians, you know, they're, 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 they're wiping everybody out and, and, and the northern tribes are gone, but you southern tribes, you kings, you need to be prepared. You are going to go into exile. You're going to be taken away. And don't fret because when you get to come back, which would happen about 200 years later, we talked about that with Nehemiah and Ezra last year, remember? When you get to come back, there will be a new leader, a new king, who will be the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. Hope during exile. But what does this everlasting father mean? It's kind of a curious term. You know, 2,730 years ago, what was, actually 750 years ago, what was he saying? And what he was talking about in the patriarchal society, in the society of the day of the ancient Near East. Leadership was found in fathers. Families were led by fathers. And families and fathers provided. Families and fathers guarded. And we also saw this in the kings. We saw this in the kings of Israel. And 
there was this weird thing that happened over and over again when you read about the kings of Israel. You might have a good king, and then eventually, he wasn't everlasting, he would die. And when that king died, who would take over? A son. And more often than not, it was a bad son. And then you'd have another bad son, and then another bad king, and then here's a good king, and then a bad king, and a good king, and so it goes. You know, we've seen this in the Roman emperors. We've seen this in any of the shows you watch about the kings and queens of England. So for them, in that day, the promise of an everlasting father was the hope that finally there will be a good leader and you won't have to worry about the next transition of power. That's what it meant to have an everlasting father. Again, this was hope during exile. And they waited. And they waited. And they probably thought that Hezekiah was maybe that leader because he was a good king. But then he made a political deal. He did all the right things. He reformed the temple. He did a lot of great stuff. But then once he got comfortable and no longer relied on God, he made a deal with this group of politicians that came in from Babylonia. And he said, hey, let's make an alliance against the Assyrians. You don't like the Assyrians. We don't like the Assyrians. Let's make an alliance. And Isaiah said, bad idea. And not even two generations later, the Babylonians took all of the Israelites out, and they were in exile. And don't you imagine that they held on to these promises that one day they'd be able to return and they'd have a new king who would be an everlasting father, a prince of peace, and the government would be on his shoulders. So that's what happened 720 years before Jesus. How did this title, these titles, get associated with Jesus? And it's pretty fascinating. If you look in Matthew chapter 4, it says, Matthew quotes Isaiah from this very same chapter. Verse 2 of Isaiah 9, it says, The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a new light has dawned. Matthew was deliberately repeating a passage from Isaiah. And this is not a new thing. Over 22 times in the Gospels, Isaiah is repeated by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were making the connection back. They were making the connection back. Paul, in his letters, makes the connection back. Jesus, as the promised one, as the Messiah, makes the connection back to Isaiah. I think it's over, I've counted, my count is 67 times in the New Testament, Isaiah is referenced by Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus is. Jesus is the wonderful counselor, the everlasting father, the mighty God, and the prince of peace. So the question is, what does everlasting father mean to us? I mean, it's kind of weird. Jesus taught us to pray to the father. Jesus is the son. He's the son of man. What does it mean to be the everlasting father? Well, first, let's look at things personally. And in a room this size, I know, I know there are a lot of father wounds. Maybe your father wasn't a great father. Maybe your father actually caused abuse. There are two men, I know three men actually, in my group that meets in my home that have had to struggle with some real father issues. Let me tell you, we don't want you to hurt. We know family wounds, they're real and they're deep. And we can pray for you. And let me tell you, these three people, these three guys in my family, my church family, they found healing in our inner healing ministry. They found hope because what we want 
we want you to realize that our image of God is the perfection of our fathers. Our image of God shouldn't be a reflection of our fathers. As bad or as great as they may be, our Holy Father is even better. I was talking with Juliana about this this week. She'll probably be comfortable with me sharing this. She didn't want to wait for heaven to experience her everlasting father. And she finds solace in knowing that relationship with a God who loves her every single day and wants to hold her hand and says, I love you. That's what it means personally to have an everlasting father. But the second thing I think we need to realize is everlasting father is a figurative term. We use lots of figurative terms when we talk about Jesus. I mean, we say Jesus is the lamb. That's a figurative term. We say Jesus is the shepherd. That's a figurative term. And it, he's a shepherd, he's a lamb, which is it? The answer is yes. It's both. He is the lamb of God. He is the good shepherd. And I read something this week which I thought was really interesting. When we talk about Father, often we're talking about the creator, the one who begins things. So like Edison, we talk about Thomas Edison as the father of electricity, or Henry Ford as the father of the automobile. Jesus is the father of our everlasting life. Jesus is the one who makes our eternal life possible. In Hebrews it says, Jesus became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. So figuratively, Jesus is our father of salvation. And then finally, there's this theological thing that I don't think I'll ever understand. Many of you know I'm working on a master's in divinity, and the more I learn in school, the more I learn I'm never going to understand. I just, I'm not going to get how Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Our creeds say it. We talk about the theophany, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, three in one. Yet Jesus is fully God and fully man, I don't get it. I don't think I'll ever get it. An ant can't understand. He can't. But Jesus decided, God decided to become a man in the form of Jesus so we could understand. Because Jesus says, when you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Because you're not going to get it. He's way too big. But when you see me, you get a clue of what it's like. Paul said, Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation, the firstborn of the dead. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that is Jesus, and through him to reconcile himself to all things on the earth and in heaven. This is good news. The everlasting father. John captures it. He says in his gospel right at the beginning. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. He is the originator and creator of everything that exists. And he says those who believe in him. John 3.16 will have everlasting life. He is our eternal father. And he makes it possible for everybody that believes in him. So that's great, that's great. So I'm saved. I got my salvation. But you know, today, things are pretty messed up. Did you see the news? Did you listen to the news? Have you opened the paper? Have you seen what's going on over there? Can you believe what they're saying? Did you see what happened last night? I mean, the world is pretty messed up. It's pretty broken. I'm pretty disturbed. What we need to realize, 
just like those Israelites did when they were in Babylon. We're in exile. We right now are in exile. We are not at home. We're not at home. There is a reason that the greatest selling song in all of history is, I will be home for Christmas. It's in us. We long for it. We are not at home. We are not with the ones we love. The Bible says, Solomon said, eternity is set in the hearts of man. He puts it in us, deep down in us. We know there's more than this. It's got to get better than this. But why don't we think about eternity in a positive light? If it's in us, why don't we think about it more often? Why is it more like the Grinch, whose heart is three sizes too small. You know why? Because his heart is caked in contemporary problems. Satan loves this. Don't get them thinking about eternity. They might get happy. Let's make them miserable, and that way nobody, they can't shine their light. Let's let them focus on everything that's miserable. Why is it that me, this is me, when I most often talk about eternity, I'm talking about the freeway traffic on the five freeway. Or I'm talking about the line at the grocery store. This line is taken forever. Why am I only thinking about eternity in a negative light? Why aren't I thinking about eternity in the positive light that we Christians get to hold on to? Eternity is set into the hearts of men. So what should we think about? Colossians, Paul says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Not on the five freeway. Not on the length of this sermon. On things above. <laughs> Positive eternity. First off, practically, when God comes back and he makes all things new, there will be no more politics. Can I get an amen? There will be no more politics. You know why? Because that whole scarcity mindset thing that drives politics because we don't think there's enough for everybody and we all go to try to get our own thing and we try to vote for the person that will help us keep our stuff or give us more stuff, that will all be gone. Because there's plenty for everybody. We will have an abundance mindset. All those news reporters, they get a whole new job. Can you imagine every day? And in this news, more good stuff. Can you imagine being the weather reporter in eternity? Well, we have it on good report that the weather's going to be good. And they'll never be wrong. There's no politics, there's no surprises, but it will be surprising how great it is. But here's the most important thing. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more tears. Death will have lost its sting. Two very close friends of mine in the last 10 days have lost their mother or their mother-in-law. Do you really believe that death has lost its sting? They do. It hurts, it's painful, but they have confidence that they will be reunited with their loved ones again. And you know what that means? Someday they will get to introduce me to their mom. We have hope. Jody, do you really believe that? I mean, do you really believe in, yes, I do. Because Jesus said, I'm going to die, and three days later, I'm coming back to life, and he did it. Yes, I believe it's true, because he said he's going to do it for us. Isaiah told the Israelites that they would one day get a righteous king in the line of David to govern them forever. Check it out. Jesus is from the line of David. Check. Jesus is perfectly righteous. Check. Jesus was crucified in the very detailed manner that Isaiah predicted in chapter 53. Check. And he came back to life. Check. And they said he was king of the Jews. 
Check. And he didn't stay dead. Check, check, check. We have hope. We will get to be with the ones we love once again. We will get to be home for Christmas. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more tears. And that's when Jesus became our everlasting father. That's the moment when he became our everlasting father. We talked about this being the season of Advent, the four weeks leading up to Christmas. That tradition, you won't find the word Advent in the Bible. That tradition actually began in the Middle Ages. Decided that the four weeks leading up to Christmas would be Advent. Actually, prior to that, during the time of Rome, Advent was celebrated. But it was celebrated as the time of Jesus' return. I think that's absolutely appropriate. Which is it? Which Advent are we celebrating? The answer is yes. We're looking back, celebrating that Jesus came, and we are looking forward, celebrating the time of Jesus' return. We're in the middle, and we're on this dual plane. We're living in earth, and we're living in the kingdom of heaven. See, eternity doesn't begin when you die. Eternity began when Jesus died. And we get to live a life now that's part of that eternal, abundant life. If we don't focus on worldly things, but we focus on heavenly things, we can enjoy and participate in that eternal life. But even so, you're like, okay, it's coming, it's coming, but how long? How long do I have to wait In 1975, I looked this up on my dad's website. My dad has the best website ever (laughs) of all of our family history. In 1975, we made a family vacation from Albuquerque, New Mexico, to come out to Southern California to do Disneyland and Knott's Berry Farms and Magic Mountain. And that was all on the agenda. But the primary thing on my agenda was going to something called the Concrete Wave. The Concrete Wave was a skate park in Anaheim in, uh, right, right next to Disneyland. And I had Skateboarder Magazine, and there was an ad for the Concrete Wave, and there were pictures of all these skaters in the day skating the Concrete Wave, and I just wanted to get to the Concrete Wave. It's a pretty long drive from Albuquerque, New Mexico, to Southern California, especially when you're in the back of the car and you're, you know, 13 years old. And you get to Needles, California in July. And you open the door, and it's literally hot as, it's pretty hot. How long, Dad? How long? Dad had the map. Dad knew where we were going. Dad told me where we were going. And I kept holding on to that magazine and looking at that picture of the concrete wave. We've got to do the same thing. We've got to hold on and look at what's planned for us. Then we can endure In Revelation chapter 6, John has a revelation. It's a revealing of what was happening right now for John, right then in the spirit realm. There was economic turmoil. There was political turmoil. Peace was being robbed. All these things were happening. And John said he has a vision of all the saints under the altar. And they're crying because the saints have given their lives, and that's what God really wants is our lives. And they're crying, how long, Lord, how long? When are you going to make things right? And God says, just wait until the full number comes in. Isn't that comforting to know there's a number? That means there's a plan. That number might include your child. That number might include your grandchild. That number might include... The relative that's driving you crazy. But there's a number. And there's a plan. So how do we endure? What should we be doing during this period where we're waiting for him to make things new? Jesus, John 3, 16. I want you to realize this. He says, for God so loved the world, he 
he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him will have everlasting life. We all know that verse. Drop down a few more. John 3.36. You may want to highlight this one in your Bible. He said, whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Present tense. We have it now. We have it today. So holding on to that fact, what do we do? What kind of people should we be? Peter, who hung out with, John, or with Jesus, he also hung out with John. What did Peter write to the church? He said, what kind of people ought you be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and, get this, speed its coming. We get to participate. We get to speed. We get to advance the return of the king. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 is famous. It's the Faith Hall of Fame, and it lists all the saints, many of the saints, and the great things they did by faith, by faith, by faith. But I want you to look at the key. Let's look at that opening passage in Hebrews 11 again. They were, long, they, these heroes, the ones who advanced the kingdom of God, they, they were longing for a better country. See, they realized this world is not their home. They were longing for a heavenly country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God was not ashamed to be called their God, for he prepared a city for them. And then it says, by faith, Abraham. They kept their eyes on what was coming. They kept their eyes on the great hope of eternity. They kept their eyes on the greatest gift that we could ever get. Realizing that this world is not our home. When we realize that we are in exile right now, when we realize and we put our hope in Jesus and his return, there's hope. We can have hope during exile because Jesus is the father of our eternity. We know there's a number. We know that God has a plan. And we get to be a part of speeding its coming, which just blows my mind. And if you've ever said the phrase, it doesn't get any better than this, I have. I've said it a lot. It usually involves a family member and being outside or someone I love. Mountaintop experiences. Like, man, it just doesn't get any better than this. We need to realize it's a lie. It is will get even better. Those moments, even if they're few and far between, those moments where we get to experience the love and the beauty and the greatness of God, those moments are a foretaste. They're an appetizer of what's going to come. It will get even better. I've started saying the phrase, if I was any better, I would already be in heaven. That's what we have to look forward to in this Advent season, this in-between period of him coming again. And this Christmas, we can help create that foretaste for others, for ourselves and for others, as we eagerly anticipate his return when he'll make all things new again. John wrote in Revelation chapter 21, excited, and I heard a loud voice from the throne crying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be their God, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away, and he who was seated on the throne said, look, I am making everything new again. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Say it with me. Come, Lord Jesus, come. One more. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's 
as we're getting ready for communion and we invite Cherie and Dave back up, I want to read a couple passages. When Jesus was getting ready to do the first Passover meal, well, the first communion meal, taking Passover and reinterpreting it for the disciples, he said in John chapter 14 to the disciples, I will not leave you as orphans. Isn't that appropriate for the everlasting father? Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me because I live. You will also live. And on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. And then he said, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. In this Advent season, as we look forward to Christmas, as we look forward to the return of the King, as we participate in communion, a sacrament set up by Jesus so we could remember what he's, not only what he's done for us, but what he's doing for us, and that he will come again he eagerly awaits to be able to participate and drink of the cup with you. But we get to do it now. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Please pray with me. Father God, thank you that you sent your son. Thank you that we have hope in exile. Help us to remember this world is not our home, but this world gives us a foretaste of the world as it should be. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you that you've authored our eternity. You've made it possible. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Spirit. Come as you're ready.